Hey, this is Dan Lehman from AutomationHelpers.com, and today we're going to talk about the Airtable API. And recently, in November 2022, Airtable announced some changes to their API to make it easier to use, to be more secure. And so we're really excited to talk about some of those changes today. In this video, we're going to assume that you have an understanding of how APIs work, and also that you've got some basic familiarity with Airtable. If you don't, feel free to check out our series on Airtable. So to get started, we are going to have the most simplest of Airtable bases. And I have just a single table. We have this table called tasks. We just have a name, notes, assignee, and a status. Something really simple, just so we can use it for testing purposes. So now that we have our base, we're gonna take a look at the developer documentation, which is talking first and foremost about authentication and how this is changing from how it's been in the past. So in the past, there were user API keys. You'd go into your account settings and you'd be able to provision a new key and then be able to plug that in as you're making your API call. The future of this now is personal access tokens. And then there's also OAuth. And, and these are right now in beta, um, but eventually when they leave beta, then they're completely doing away with those user API keys. They're deprecating them. Now, of course, that, they always have a deprecation period that's gonna take 12 months. So it's not an immediate rush, but it's important for developers to know that, hey, if you've made integrations in the past, that this is going to change now in the future. So the personal access tokens are going to be, you know, in this case, when we're developing something for our own company or for a client that we have, or we're just testing something out, that's where you're going to want to use a personal access token. And then OAuth is going to go through the OAuth security flow. If you're releasing, let's say, an app, like maybe you have a, a third-party uh, app that you have, and you wanna be able to release this to lots of different Airtable clients. So think about putting it like in an app store kind of thing for them to be able to utilize. That's when you're going to choose OAuth. So for the purposes of this video, we're gonna use the personal access token. And so I'm in the developer site, airtable.com slash create slash tokens. This is also where you can set up uh, OAuth if you need it. But for personal access tokens, we can go ahead and create a new token. And we just need to give it some kind of a name. So I'll just automation helpers test. And this is where we need to add the scopes that are going to be utilized for this. So if we don't have the scope correct permissions for it, then the API is not going to be able to make those calls that we need it to. And so I'm going to actually everything here, we need to be able to see the data in the records. We need to read it. We need to write. We also want the ability to read and write comments. And then this one's kind of cool. This is new for those of you who aren't on the enterprise plan is being able to read and write the schema. And then there's one more for webhooks, uh, which is great. This is also exciting and new that you can like programmatically create a webhook or delete a webhook. We're not gonna get into that so much in this video, but you could also add that scope if you need it. Of course, you wanna make it as restrictive as possible, only utilizing the scopes that you actually need. And then you're giving permissions to what, which bases um, are this, are, is this able to be utilized for. So I'm doing it for my Airtable API base that I made. And again, that's just the title of the base is Airtable API. You can call it anything that you want and create that token. And then you're going to be able to get that token. You're not going to want to share it with anybody that you're not supposed to. Uh, I'm not actually going to use this for anything. I'm going to delete it out. So it's fine that you're seeing it here. And then from here, now that we have those scopes set up, I'm going to use Postman. I always find that that's the easiest just because everyone's writing in, in different programming languages potentially. And so in Postman, we've got the ability to be able to test APIs and things of that nature. So you might already have a Postman account. If you don't, it's free. You can set it up really easy to get started. And one of the first things that I do when I set this up is that I create a collection. So I've got an Airtable collection. And within that collection, I have the different calls that I want to make. And so from here, we know that we're going to have to set up some authorization. And what I like to do is I create variables where I can store this information. So I've got the values uh, blurred out here because you don't need to know that. But the token is where we can copy and paste that in, the token that we just got on the previous page. And then I'm also, just to make it easier as I'm constructing requests, I'm putting in the base URL here, that api.airtable.com slash v0 version zero. 
And then I'm also putting in my base ID as well as a table ID. You can do this how you want it. If you want to have like the, the unique identifiers baked into the request, you can do that. But sometimes just from a visual standpoint, it's easier for me to think about it just as the base ID and table ID. So from here, we'll set up the authorization. So they have several different types of auth that you could use. Again, you can go through the OAuth2 flow if you need that. Um, but in this case, we're going to use bearer token. And then because I have that stored as that variable called token, that's where I'm able to use that in curly brackets for it to be able to insert that for me. You could just copy and paste it in if you want, especially for testing purposes. It doesn't matter a whole lot. So now we're ready to make our first request. This, of course, probably the most easy thing that you can do is uh, just making a request to be able to fetch information with a GET request. And so we always start with that base URL. Again, you could manually type that in if you want, but I find it easiest just to say URL slash the base ID that we have. And then we have our table ID. Um, and just to be really clear as we're looking at this here, if you're trying to deconstruct it from the URL itself, this is going to be our base ID that we're looking at. It starts with app, and then you've got your table ID, TBL, and that's going to be your table ID. So if you're constructing this yourself, you can copy those. And just so you know, it does actually include the APP and the TBL. So I remember when I first was getting started, I wasn't sure if those were just extra characters that were the same, but they're actually part of those IDs. All right, and so if we make that get request and we send that, then let me pull this up a little bit here. Then you'll notice that we're going to get back the records that we have, and this would be an array of records. And of course, we only have a single record here, so it's not fetching multiple of those for us. And so we can see the data that comes back. We've got an ID, that unique identifier for the record. We have the created type. We've got the field, so this is like a, a lookup for the owner, is this assignee here. And then aside from that object, we've got those couple additional fields for notes, name, and status. So pretty simple to get started and make that call. And just to show you from the, the authorization side, when you have the authorization on the collection, you can actually just inherit it from the parent. I do that because then I can make a whole bunch of requests and really just handle the authorization one time. You don't have to do that. You could handle the authorization on each individual request if you prefer. But just for simplicity, as I'm testing, this is how I usually handle it. So that's a GET request. Now, um, of course, if you want to be able to update records, that's where, usually where you're talking about a put or a patch. I don't think we'll have to actually show that here to, because we'll end up doing a POST request, which will be similar enough. But one thing I did want to call out is that a patch is going to only update the fields that you specify. So if you put in these three fields, great, we're going to leave the other fields, leave that data the same, and we're going to update just those fields we specify. But a put request is going to be destructive. So that means if you just update that one field, it's going to clear out all the other fields of data. So just make sure that as you're making updates that you understand and are able to distinguish between your patch and put requests. All right, let's go ahead and create a post request. And so this is going to be really easy to do. I actually pretty much just copied this since I had that single record to be able to put into my data here. So because this is a post request for us to be able to create that record, we're sending that data to the server for it to know how to create that record, what fields it needs to include. So to do this in the body, so we're not going to do it as params, we're going to do it in the body. I actually set this to raw, and then you've got the ability, I think it defaults to text, so make sure to select the dropdown to use JSON. And then we're able to construct it so you can pass it Again, uh, an array of records if you want. So it would have the ability to create multiple records with a single API call. And this is where I was able to, to copy that structure. So something like an assignee, which is a little bit complex of an object because it's got that ID and the email and the name, we're able to uh, copy and paste this in. And so if we now send this post request, it's going to return basically the same thing that we sent it and additionally include a created time and the ID that comes back. And then if we go back to our table, you'll notice that we have that newly created record. We created this from the API. So that 
data that we sent now has created that record. We've been able to do a get request, a post request. For those of you who work with APIs all the time, this should be feeling nice and at home for handling that. Now, one of the things that's come up historically, so if, if you didn't have the enterprise plan before, which I mean, lots of people are using non-enterprise plans. And, it, you know, there's kind of an issue of, of something like, let's say the status field. Okay, well, if we do that get request, where are we? This get request, and the status comes back as to do. Okay, well, that's fine. We just interpret it as a string, but we have no idea what available options that we have to us. You know, we've got to do, but when we're in the UI, we've got this nice drop down and we can see there's to do in progress and, and done. So, of course, we could make all these requests and then we could compile those options ourselves. Let's say if we're making an application and we want to make a drop down with those values. But with companies that, you know, really value having great um, documentation and API endpoints, one of the things that they do is they offer a metadata API to be able to pull information from that. Now, before we actually get into the, the metadata API, I want to show that there's also a way that you can look at things like this in the UI. So you've got the ability at any point, if you go to Airtable.com and then you do slash, and you put in your base ID again, and then slash API, slash docs. This is so cool. This is like what every developer wants is to be able to have personalized documentation. So this isn't written, just generally speaking, this is actually written, or I should say generated dynamically for each base. So I've got this Airtable API base, and it generates the documentation for that. And so let's say I were to, I don't know, update this and call it tasks two, for lack of any creativity on my part. If we come back to that documentation and we refresh it, it regenerates it. And so all of the values and the fields and everything that we have is now exactly what we need. So if we wanted to look at the fields for our tasks two table, we'd be able to see the field IDs, the description, the data type for it. And so it's just super helpful as you're doing any kind of integration work to have all of this information at your fingertips. It makes me smile as a developer every time I see this. So very, very helpful. Another thing you'll notice, again, there's these field IDs. And sometimes in Airtable's documentation, they talk about using the table name, like tasks two, or using the table ID. I'm always going to recommend using the IDs of these things because if those labels change, I mean, Airtable makes it so easy to uh, relabel anything in the system that I wouldn't want my integration to break if that were the case. So I always gravitate towards using the IDs for just about anything. But of course, you can do what makes the most sense for you and the business there. So we've got our API documentation here. But now we can also do this by getting the tables metadata. And so again, if we look at the URL structure, this is the base URL slash meta slash bases. Then we have the base ID. Again, this is our unique base ID followed by slash tables. So if we had multiple tables, this is going to return the metadata for all of that. So let me make that request and I'll make this a little bit bigger here again. And now we're able to see, okay, here's the ID for that table. Here's the primary field. Here are the fields that are included. And so now, again, to the example we were talking about not knowing the various options for that single select, now we can see, oh, type single select and the options um, we've got to do, in progress, and done. And we can also see how's that represented visually with the color as well. So this just makes it so much easier. Again, if you're trying to build, I don't know, maybe you have your own custom forms that you're doing. And you want to be able to pull these options and present them to the user to be able to select it. A metadata API is going to be able to get you there. And this is part of what that latest release is, is making this available now to the lower plans instead of just reserving it for the enterprise accounts. So I'm very excited about this update here. And again, we can go a step further, which is not just to retrieve the metadata, but we can actually 
create fields and tables and bases all programmatically. I'm not going to show you how to do all of them because, again, it's very similar for each of them. But let's just talk about if we wanted to create a new field. Again, we're doing a post request. This is to the URL slash meta slash bases, base ID, tables. That's what we had for the last request. And now we're telling it the specific table ID, the ID of that table that we're looking at, and then slash fields. And we're going to, again, send this as raw and make sure that we're selecting JSON here. And then we can just construct our object, put in the fields description, name. Um, we can tell it how to appear in the UI. So we're, we're going to do essentially a Boolean. Um, for them, it's a checkbox. And we'll create that. So let's go ahead and create this new field. And again, this will come back and essentially say, yes, we created this. And then if we go back into the UI, we see we now have our new field here and we can check off and, and update those statuses. So again, just taking a look at the API and what all is available. Now we can create update bases and tables and fields. That's all part of that metadata. We didn't really talk about this, but you can also be inserting comments which you can do like on a record object. Um, there's these activities and you can leave a comment rather than having it in the UI. You can now do that programmatically as well. And then the last thing again is um, those web hooks and being able to create and list out those web hooks. So I hope this was helpful for you as we were able to talk about some of the exciting updates to the Airtable API. I'd love to hear what kinds of projects you're working on from an integration standpoint. Is this something that you're doing on behalf of your company? Are you trying to build an integration that you want to share with other Airtable users? Feel free to leave your comments down below. And thanks for watching this video on Airtable API. Love to help you if you have any questions. And of course, our team at automationhelpers.com is able to help you. If, if you're going through this and you're thinking, boy, I'm not really familiar with APIs and you want to be able to uh, create an integration. That's something that our team works with all the time. And we'd be happy to help you out with that. So reach out on our website at automationhelpers.com. Thanks.